I went to Japan for the first time in November of 2019. I had just gone through a really significant breakup. I had just started my career as a software developer and I was only like a year out of having almost died from competitive bodybuilding. To say I was lost at this point in my life would be putting it pretty mildly. That trip spawned a more than a half decade so far love affair with the country. It led to two approved visas that were then indefinitely delayed and canceled because COVID did what it did to all of us. And three canceled trips but it did result in finally two more trips back to Japan. Since then, I've spent hundreds upon hundreds of hours immersing in the Japanese language and in the Japanese culture. I started this channel and a lot of it early on was about Japanese cooking. I eventually started a business around ramen pop-ups and making my own tonkotsu gyokai ramen. And I fell in love with that for a while. If you've watched my other video that just came out, I'll link it above my head somewhere. I'm now learning how to draw for the first time, more in the style of anime and manga, and that has given me so much. So needless to say that the experiences I've had in Japan and the friends that I've made there have really profoundly shaped who I am today. So now you're probably wondering about the title of this video and if it means so much to me and if I've spent so many years on learning the language, why is it that I have quit or am quitting, at least for now? Well, we'll get to that in just a second, but first I wanna circle back to how that first trip came to be. A very close friend of mine had been watching me grasp at straws to regain a sense of direction in my life because of all the aforementioned chaos that was happening. She took a pilgrimage to Japan every year. She took it upon herself to invite me to come with her for this trip in 2019. Now, up until this point, I had never really left the country before. I had gone to the Bahamas a couple times as a kid, but like before you needed a passport to be able to do it. I didn't have a passport as an adult and I had no understanding of Japanese at the time. And at that time, I didn't really even have two pennies to pinch together. I couldn't have afforded an emergency repair bill of any kind. I had some outstanding medical bills and collections from my heart and all of that. You know, I, I didn't even really have enough to, to get by, let alone a trip across the entire world. But I did have something. I had something really compelling. I had that inner voice, that like Jiminy Cricket intuition that was screaming at me to go to figure out a way to make it make sense. It felt like the very fibers of my being were being pulled in this direction and so I said yes. As so often happens when you start saying yes, a couple of weeks later, a non-stop flight from Denver to Tokyo popped up for dirt cheap. I think I paid like a five or six hundred dollars, which does not happen to Japan anymore. And a couple weeks after that, I got the sign up bonus from a credit card that I had for forgotten was coming and I used those points to pay for more than half of my hotels while I was there. And in the midst of planning all of this, I suddenly remembered that when I was a kid, I had in the binders right over there, we'll, we'll go get it. Got it. And so when I was a kid, I had kind of inexplicably co collected this uh, all these Japanese edition Pokemon cards in the original Hiragana, Katakana, Kanji. Um, and I, you know, I didn't know at the time. I had no understanding of the language or really a desire to learn it. But I remembered that I had these, so I got them back from my parents. After having done that, I realized that like in one way, shape or form, Japan had been a profound part of my life for as long as I could remember, whether it was food or video games or gateway drug anime like Dragon Ball Z. And even to little things like Japanese food was always what I wanted to celebrate after something small like good grades or a play in elementary school or something like this. That first trip, poured into my soul. It gave me a new sense of direction. It gave me a sense of purpose and something to look forward to. More than that though, it showed me a world that I didn't even know existed. One that was so profoundly different from the world that I was used to that I really could barely comprehend it. It inspired me to travel more widely and more deeply since then. That trip in Japan showed me more kindness and hospitality than I had ever experienced. It showed me food and coffee and beverages and experiences that were on a caliber of quality that as an American I really couldn't comprehend. More than anything else though, that first trip sparked a profound desire to become fluent in Japanese. And ultimately, I really wanted to move there. So as soon as I got back, I took the AJAT approach to Japanese, which is all Japanese all the time. It was super popular and kind of like early, I don't, don't want to say early internet, but like a while ago, 10, 15 years ago, something like this. I dove down the rabbit hole. I only listen to Japanese music and I only listen to Japanese podcasts. I listened to NHK News in the morning and I hired a phenomenal tutor on italki. Her name is Akati. Akati is 
awesome. If you're looking for a Japanese tutor still, I highly, highly recommend her. I watched anime and J-dramas with Japanese subtitles instead of English ones, and read manga, and devoured Anki decks, and did my best to remember all of the kanji using Wani Kani, great app, and remember the kanji, the Heisek method. And over the last four-ish years, I've learned a tremendous amount, and if you're in the middle of your Japanese journey or thinking about starting to learn it, I'll link all of these resources in the description below, because I really do think they're awesome. I got a lot out of them. So, like I said, I've spent about four years on Japanese at this point in my life. And I'm nowhere near as good as I could have become over the period of the last four years. But I did get pretty far. I've been able to enjoy a lot of native content without needing to look very much up with the original subtitles. I'm able to have conversations with native speakers and really just feel closer to and enjoy Japan in a way that I would be unable to do had I not taken the time to acquire the amount of language that I had. One of the proudest accomplishments in my life so far was actually uh, not this most recent trip, but the trip before that when someone asked me for the first time, when did you live here? I, I didn't get a Nihongo Jozu. I got a, your Japanese is actually good enough to like, what, when were you here? And I'm really, really proud of that. So again, at this point, you're probably asking why quit? Why are you walking away from this thing that's so important to you? And the answer to that is perhaps just a wee bit philosophical. And if you're new here, most of my videos are. If you like that kind of thing, go check out some of the other ones. Stick around for the ride while we ph philosophize philosophize, philosophize a little bit. Remember when I said that Japan in many ways feels more like home than America ever did to me? That still remains true, but it also reveals an opportunity for me to face the music, so to speak. Even if Japan feels more like home to me, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how long I were to live there, if I decided to move, and no matter how many times I go to visit, I will never entirely fit in. And that's, that's one thing, that's a known quantity for anyone who's not Japanese who decides to spend time living there. But there's something even a little bit more deep than that for me. For as long as I'm fixated on somewhere else being home, being right, being better in some way, I am incapable of focusing on what I have right in front of me and enjoying that experience for what it is. It's it's impossible. I could have everything that I've ever wanted. I could have my dream life unfolding in front of me and some voice in the back of my head would still be saying, yeah, but it's not Japan. It's still not Japan. You still don't live there. You're still not having that life. So the story starts playing. I'd be happier if I moved there, I'd be happier if I were more fluent, or if I spent more time studying, or if I consumed more content in Japanese, or had more Japanese friends. I don't need to worry about the life right in front of me, I don't need to do my hobbies, I don't need to take care of the relationships I have, I just need to focus on getting there as soon as I can. That's All of this is what starts playing in my head. And if, if that happened, then everything would finally be okay and I, I would be happy. Now this is, of course, untrue. The novelty and challenge and stimulation that j moving to Japan would provide would for a while be everything that I ever wanted it to be. And then someday it would just become my life. This actually ended up happening to a very dear friend of mine who did decide to move there. And there's a really big crash that comes with realizing that this dream that you had built up doesn't solve everything. It, it, it's not a replacement or a fix. Eventually that just becomes your life too. That can be really difficult to deal with. What I came to realize after my most recent trip was that I had arrived in a very real fork in the road. I felt split in two. I, I had to make a decision. Watching J-dramas and reading manga and talking to my tutor no longer felt fulfilling or stimulating. It, it made me feel profoundly sad. And the sadder I got for not being there, not engaging more fully with Japan, the more strained my relationships here became. The more I kind of like resisted the idea of letting go and I wanted to double down on Japanese and, and moving there and all of these things. And the more I tried to just cling to that, the worse and worse and worse the things for me here became. So I continued to put other things in my life that I cared deeply about to the side, like this channel, like jujitsu, like playing guitar, like my relationships, my friends, my family, all so that I could prioritize learning Japanese. It became my catch-all excuse for why things in my life didn't feel the way that I wanted them to. I finally realized I could keep pursuing this dream, this idea of a thing that might exist somewhere someday, and really, truly throw away the incredible life I was starting to build here. Or 
I could shelf Japan and Japanese and focus on what was right here, right now. I ultimately chose the life and the people that were right in front of me. And then I continued to kind of in the background still cling to this idea. And I was forlorn and a little bit depressed and upset for quite a while. This was a profoundly upsetting and difficult time for me and even more so for the people around me. I had theoretically chosen them in this life. I had canceled my Japanese lessons. I wasn't consuming content anymore. I was just trying to focus on what was here and happening with them, but I wasn't all here. Some part of me was still stuck there. It really actually wasn't until a couple of weeks ago that I really started to truly double down and focus on my life here and on my hobbies and my relationships and, and my passions. And some incredible things have happened. My relationships are better than they've ever been. I got my purple belt in jiu-jitsu after five years. Things are just like starting to line up and, and happen sequentially now that I've let this be what it is. I also now can finally watch anime and read manga with English subtitles or in English translations and I for the first time in four years don't feel guilty about it. Now some people watching this video are inevitably going to fall into the but you gave up on your dreams camp. And like kind of, sort of, you're a little bit right. In some ways I did give up on my dreams. But here's what I have to say to that. It's okay to give up on your dreams. Contrary to what we get sold by social media and the internet and this wild creator attention economy that we live in, it is perfectly okay to want and accept a normal life. I'd even go so far as to say is your dreams might actually be what's holding you back from having the life that you really want to have. They might be what's getting in the way of you actually becoming who you're really supposed to be. It's okay to evolve and move on and let go of an idea or a piece of your identity that you clung really tightly to. Maybe that dream became less of a dream and more of a shield to try to protect you from the things in your life that didn't feel right. That's worth considering. It's also completely okay to come back to those dreams someday. For as long as we're still here, it's actually never too late. When I was in Japan over this last Christmas and New Year's, I made a promise to myself that I would never move there until I figured out whatever it was inside of me that caused me to want to run away from the things that were going really well in my life. Because to use a trite cliche, wherever you go, in fact, there you are. I've only lived in one lease to completion as an adult. I've had six jobs in seven years, and I've mentioned this before, but like there is a litany of hobbies that just kind of exist in a graveyard that I've given up on or picked up and put down over the years. Yes, to nobody's surprise, I have ADHD and all of these things, or at least some of these things could be chalked up as complications of that, but there's something deeper to that, to this. There is something inside of me that feels stability and feels things going well and feels momentum starting to happen that becomes profoundly uncomfortable. So I made a commitment to myself that until I could take that discomfort and allow it to be what it is and continue running forward with momentum for all the things that I actually care about, that I think we all actually care about, like stability, love, peace, contentedness, passions, things that feel valuable to me, until I could let those be what they are, I wasn't gonna let myself shelf them for the idea of something else anymore. Now, I still firmly believe I'll live in Japan someday. I would look back on my life and feel like I had missed out on something important to me if I didn't take the time to do that. It still feels more like home to me than America does in a lot of ways, and I think it probably always will. I identify much more with the Japanese psyche and way of life than I do with the American one, but it's ultimately become a someday thing that I'm perfectly okay with letting rest until it's actually time. I'm ready to let go of this idea of putting everything else on hold until I arrive at some potential dream destination. I'm not allowing it to become a distraction or a cop-out or the excuse that I use to not pursue the things that are available to me right now. Instead, I'm trying to shift my perspective more to let the things that I love about Japan and Japanese and the culture steer who I am here, steer who I am in my day-to-day. -day. So all that's to say, I'd encourage you to look at the things in your life that might be starting to become your catch-all excuse for why you don't yet have the things that you want. There's a really great quote from Dr. K on Healthy Gamer I heard recently that I think about all the time, and he said, be very cautious about anything your mind tells you about your life that is not actionable. That is something I think about every single day now. And in my case, my story playing in the background of my mind being, I can't be 
happy until I move to Japan. Well, that's like semi-actionable, but the rift between present moment and that is so large it might as well be a fiction. It might as well not be actionable. And that's going to cause a lot of suffering. What is your thing? What is the thing that you say to yourself someday once I have this, once I achieve this, once I get this, then I will finally be happy. I think whatever that thing is, is worth reflecting on. It might be worth looking at ways that you can embrace the present moment just a little bit more. Embrace the things that you have every day or that you could do every day that could move you a little bit closer to fulfillment than what you experience right now. And maybe if you focused on those things a little bit more instead of closing the door on them to fantasize about something that could happen someday maybe, I think it's possible that you might end up feeling much better now than you would have ever felt upon realizing this dream. It's also helpful to realize that we are never done. Happiness is not a thing that is attained and then it's fixed and we just hold on to it forever. It's an ephemeral and fleeting feeling that is best found in my experience by consistently engaging with things that we enjoy day after day after day. Now, as always, if you've made it this far, it would mean the world to me if you could drop this video a like. I would love to hear in the comments what your thing is, what your excuse is, or what your dream is that you allow to be the thing that holds you back from engaging with life right right in front of you right now. I'd also love suggestions for what else you'd like to hear me talk about on this channel. I love to talk about things clearly. Above all though, it would mean the world to me if you could hit that subscribe button so that I can continue to engage with and take the time to make content like this and think about my life a little bit more deeply and present it to all of you in a way that hopefully sparks some additional thought as well. So with that, Till next time, folks.